Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you're watching uh, USANA's Foundation's One Quad Math Initiative, and today we are proud to have Dr. Cleo Pascal with us. Dr. Cleo Pascal is an Associate Fellow in Energy, Environment and Resources Program and the Asia Pacific Program at Chatham House. She also has associations with several well known governmental and non governmental organizations across the globe. Her area of interest includes the strategic implication of the intersection of geopolitical, geoeconomics, and geophysical change. She particularly specializes in Indo Pacific affairs and is also the research lead on Chatham House, House's project on perceptions of strategic shifts in the Indo Pacific, especially from the point of view of the United States, the UK, India, Japan, Oceania, and France. She is also a distinguished author and contributed to several books and has been widely uh, uh, published in uh, globally reputed academic and popular media spaces. Some of her major contributions are on platforms such as The World Today, The Diplomat, Defense News, Washington Examiner, BBC, and the list goes on. She also has more than two dozen awards for, pub for her published work, and she's also the writer of a 13-part winning Emmy-winning uh, Emmy TV documentary series. She actively engages in public commentary in her domain of exercise, expertise and provides crucial insights on a wide range of issues in the Indo-Pacific region. And most importantly, she is an integral part of the USANAS Foundation family. So welcome, Cleo. Thank you so much for making the time today and joining us. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure. I'm, I am particularly delighted to be part of the USANAS Foundation family. You guys are we guys, you guys, us guys are doing some very important work, especially uh, around the Indo-Pacific, and uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, so, Cleo, I think it's only fair that we begin by addressing the situation, the current moment in history that we're living in, and the unfortunate humanitarian disaster which is taking place in Afghanistan. So, I would really like to hear your views on how do you see what is unraveling in Afghanistan impacting the South Asian region and the Indo-Pacific region at it's, it is a inconceivable, heartbreaking, um, avoidable tragedy, you know, what's going on. And, and it's, uh, it's actually hard to, to really comprehend how, how quickly, uh, it has become so bad. And it's, it's, it's also hard to know how it's going to evolve. Um, there are some things that are very clear. One is uh, the, the, the U.S. has lost legitimacy as a security partner in a, in a way that is uh, cataclysmic. So, uh, and this has nothing to do, obviously, with the men and women who've been trying, who've been in the country for 20 years and trying trying their best and all that sort of stuff. It, it very much has to do with the way that this departure was managed um, and the last few months leading up to this, this departure. Um, you would, you know, in June, the US Embassy was displaying pride flags for the gay community and all that did was it, it encouraged people to come out of, of hiding so that now they're easier to be targeted and killed by the Taliban. Like it, it's just that this, the, the, the level of, of kind of betrayal, not, not, uh, not only of the country, but of the values that the US was, is presenting to the world is on display for everybody to see you know, it, it's not the American people, it's not the rank and file, but this, this leadership, this leadership um, c clearly uh, is not a reliable security partner. So that has a lot of implications uh, for the Quad and the Indo-Pacific writ large. Um, what we're what we're also seeing obviously is china trying to rush into that security vacuum um and that will undoubtedly pull it even closer to pakistan and uh very um 
unpleasant elements and those fighters, if nothing happens in Afghanistan, if there isn't a pushback from within the country and those Taliban fighters are contained within Afghanistan, then they will likely be redirected towards India with, you know, via Pakistan with Chinese support. Because in the context of the Indo-Pacific and the Quad, the second biggest threat to China after the US, which has now been terribly weakened, is India. You know, India is, a, is an existential threat to China uh, in many ways. Uh, first of all, it's a, it's a democracy of a billion people. So it uh, undercuts the Chinese Communist Party rationale that says that only an authoritarian or in fact a fascist dictatorship can, can control a billion people while well, India's doing just fine, you know, next door. Uh, also, India is in the position to take some of the supply chains that are being redirected out of China. India is a pluralistic society. Uh, it's, it's not building concentration camps for uh, religious minorities unlike China. You know, so it, so India is very much, just by its mere existence, a threat to the rationale of the existence of the Chinese Communist Party. And as the Chinese Communist Party and the PLA gets pulled in via Pakistan into Afghanistan, you know, then there, I would expect that it would increasingly try to use those proxies to, to go after India. So, you know, it's... Uh, cascading catastrophe potentially um and it, the implications are, are are far beyond that geographic area because if you, if you look at the other indo-pacific security partners of of the us like japan you know for example at this point japan must be thinking we better get some nuclear weapons pretty fast <laughs> You know, um, Australia, which has been doing an excellent job of standing up to China, must also be wondering about what kind of backing it'll have. Um, you know, the Philippines must be, you know, it, it's it's just, that it's, it's all up in the air. So, so in that context, India becomes even more important, you know, as a potential security partner to all of those other Indo-Pacific allies that are more concerned about the U.S. So, if you if you're starting to get kind of a fragmentation between China and the free world, the free world is not necessarily coalescing around the U.S. at this moment in time. Um, and the question is whether you know India can can create a third way that helps coalesce for that. So the the implications are are enormous and. Uh, it's not, it's a, a very, very difficult time in history. Thank you so much for that, Leo. And I think you really said the tone for this discussion. I'd like you to elaborate more on uh, when you spoke about how China is taking over this vacuum. So what do you see the future role of China being in the Indo-Pacific region? And how do you see the US-China competition playing out in this region? Would it be a decisive force in shaping the regional order? So China, I, I, I would expect, like, again, sort of we're in this really, really volatile time. Um, but if China it, sees what's happening in Afghanistan as weakness on the part of the US, um, we, we saw what happened with COVID. Like as soon as it saw weakness in the area, it pushed harder. And so if it sees the Afghan collapse as, an, as another moment of weakness, then I would expect it to start ramping up activities directly. Um, you know, it, this does not, the US administration that's in place now, given what just happened in Afghanistan, doesn't look like a US administration that would back up the Senkakus you know, for Japan or would, or would back up Taiwan or would back up, like it doesn't, it doesn't l look like it would make those decisions, you know? Um, so China has a habit of 
trying to push up to where the red line is. And now they're, and they're what, and it, with what we are seeing happening now, I would be hard pressed to know what would be their, the red line of this administration. You know, I, I don't know at what point they would act. I, I just, I don't know. Like I, and if, if I don't, you know, I'm not a genius and I don't have any special knowledge, um, but there, you know, there must be a lot of people feeling the same that I do. And that's not a good position for the world to be in. So again, that puts a lot more weight on, on India because if uh, Taiwan is threatened, if, if China invades Taiwan and takes Taiwan, once that's secured, they're coming after the Himalayas next, right? So, the, and, the, and the Indian strategic community is very clear that, you know, its security is tied to what's going on in the maritime domain in the Indo-Pacific. That's the whole rationale in part for the Quad. So, you know, the, the, the pressure on India to start to, or not start, it already is, but even more so to take some of this burden is is increasing and the, you know the, the country the country already has a lot of challenges you know and and the responsibility of the government you know is people need jobs <laughs> you know pe pe people need vaccines people need like there's it's not as if you know india doesn't have enough challenges already um you know that it apart from saving the world <laughs> but, but uh, you know but at this point given your because your your questions about chinese activity and india has been actually much more clear about pushing back on chinese activity through through a whole range of things like from banning the apps to rolling up some of the spy networks to restricting chinese fdi you know to like in, in all of the ways that the U.S. hasn't done. So um, I know I know the question was a, a China-U.S. question, but I think that we're in a period where the question is actually going to start to become a China-India and allies question. Thank you so much, Cleo. So uh, that brings me to my next question is that you would agree with me for the longest time India was seen as the weakest link of the board. Um, and but now, of course, it's come to play a very prominent role. So how do you think this current role of India in the Quad is going is evolving and how is it shaping the policy of the region at large? So I would push back on that India being the weakest link of the Quad thing. I, 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 I think I think you're I think it's a legitimate you're asking the question is fine um but there's been uh, a very concerted effort by other countries to blame india for their lack of commitment okay so and and we've seen it recently a lot with um kevin rudd for example in australia who's been writing a lot of uh, op-eds lately um, and he wrote a letter to the Sunday Guardian saying, it wasn't me that killed the quad the first time around. And, you know, whereas, you know, we have statements from his minister at the time saying, we're, we're not doing this, you know, we're, we're going to pull out. So, I, you know, I think that there's been, there's a lot of uh, vested interests in, in other sectors to blame India for this. And, and I think India had, you know, obviously there were internal restraints and all that stuff, but also there was, you know, the, the, that same Australian government gave, switched the policy on on provisions of nuclear stuff for, for India as well. You know, there, there were a lot of other things going on. Um, so you are right, that was, that is the, that was the perception and there is a concerted effort by in some quarters to maintain that as being the perception, and uh, and I think it does a disservice to, for example, 
both India, but also the current government of Australia that is really standing up to, to, to China. Because by, by, say, by blaming it on India, it doesn't show you how far the Australians have come in their dealing with China, right? So I think I I'd like a little bit more um, self-reflection by those who are blaming India. <laughs> um, you know, and, sim and similarly, India had some very, India in 2007, 2008, was a, it was a different country, it was different circumstances. There was a different level of willingness to do defense agreements with India. India wasn't getting the technology sharing that uh, it has now. Um, you know, a lot of things have changed. Uh, so all of that aside, um, I think that, uh, you know, in India is, there is no Indo-Pacific without India. There is no quad without India. I mean, you know, there is, it, it's a, it's a, it's the anchor for, for the Indian Ocean, but it's more than that. It's, uh, it's a idea, it's a hope. It's something that goes back to, uh, you know, the old sp spice roots. Like it, you know, India has, has before the British, you know, for all that time, India was all across the Indo-Pacific. That's why there are Hindu temples in Bali. That's why there's, you know, Buddhism all over the various countries in the Pacific. That's why the Thai Kings have the name Rama. Like, you know, it's, it's an, in, it's an integral part of the, of the region. Um, in in ways that no other culture is, um, and it's a it's a country that you know I I, I do a lot of work in uh, the Pacific Islands, and Pacific Islanders are very interested in trying to engage more with India. It, it, there's not it's not a genetic thing. It's just there's a comfort level, a culture, a, a cultural compatibility. An uh, economic compatibility. You know, the, the thing about the other three members of the Quad is they're all uh, Western economies. They're expensive, and they're and they're built. They they function on the assumption of a fairly well-funded social welfare network. So the you know the the core economic unit in india is m more the extended family you know if you have if you have to, if you need school fees or something like that there'll be you know cousin and uncle and whatever you know there's some there's the extended family is this is the economic welfare network right that's m much more common in all the rest of the indo pacific than what you'd find in Japan or what you'd find in the US or what you'd find in Australia where you, you'd go to the state or you could get interest rates at 2% or 3%. Like it's a, the whole economic foundation is fundamentally different. So, so in that way, India can offer um, an, a level of economic understanding to more of the countries of the Indo-Pacific that is an effective counter to the way that China comes into these countries, which is economic. So China comes in with low cost goods and, and kind of re retail level economics. They set up, for example, Chinese shops in Tonga. You're not gonna get US shops or Japanese shops or Australian shops that can compete with them, but you can get Indian shops that compete with them, right? And that pushes them out of the economy. And if they're not in the economy, they don't have the political leverage and the strategic leverage. So India is indispensable. Thank you so much for that, Leo. Uh, let me take this discussion now a little further away and talk about the Quad Plus arrangement. So there's been a lot of talk about Quad Plus. So can you tell me a little bit about how this arrangement is shaping up? What is it going to be like? And more importantly, will it make the Quad more inclusive? Will it provide an avenue for, say, the ASEAN members to join and sort of mitigate some of their uh, regional insecurities which they may have about it about Quad overshadowing ASEAN? So how is this shaping up? Please summarize it for us. So 
I, I mean, especially with uh, what's going on now with the U.S., I think that, you know, the, the, the Quad, the four countries of the Quad, each of the countries has logistics agreements with the other three countries from a military perspective. Like, they're, they're, pra they're practical interoperabilities that are being developed through Malabar and things like that, that it's very it's difficult to, to, to integrate more into that at this stage, it would be nice, it would be good if they could just be consolidated. There isn't even a quad headquarters, right? So I, what, I, what I would think would make sense is from a interoperability and engagement perspective, make sure the quad is solid first. And you could add on uh, individual countries for specific exercises, like, like they did recently you know you kind of you canada just did a quad plus submarine hunting exercise off of off of guam for example so you could you know you you bring it in for specific exercises but first con consolidate those four at the same time uh what would be very interesting to develop is and this is an idea that comes out of india it would be an indo-pacific charter which is modeled on the Atlantic Charter uh, that was uh, signed by originally uh, by the uh, US and the UK be just before the Americans entered the war about what in, in 41, about what they thought um, the world should look like after the war. Okay? So, you know, what the principles are and they've just re-signed, Biden and Johnson just re-signed the Atlantic, new Atlantic Charter. But the 21st century isn't the Atlantic century, it's the Indo-Pacific century. So what would be interesting, especially in the context where you're talking about the ASEAN and stuff, is to have an Indo-Pacific Charter anchored by India and Japan, which presents what India and Japan and may, you know, may be supported by Australia and the US would like to see for the Indo-Pacific that then those other countries can sign on to. And those would be the, the codification, the red, the, the red lines of expected behavior. So it's not an, an Asian NATO, nothing like that, but at least it could be self-supporting and it could have maybe an element of like a, an economic article five. So if, you know, if China is punishing, you know, Taiwan by not buying its pineapples, other countries that have signed on to the Indo-Pacific Charter can prioritize buying Taiwanese pineapples. You know, I mean, just little things like that. So I would, I would see two parallel tracks developing to, to bring in other countries. It could be wrong. This brings me to my last question, uh, where uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about how the discourse of Indo-Pacific has evolved and what are the role of extra-regional powers, particularly the European powers, which we've seen are showing a lot of interest uh, in the region. So if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about that. What role do they play in shaping this discourse? <laughs> so, so as an Indian, how do you feel about the Europeans coming back into the Pacific? <laughs> So that's, that's basically how I feel. I mean, the, the the only one that's a little bit different is the French because, you know, I mean, they they do they have territories and they've been very supportive of of India. I mean, the French are a whole other category. The French operate for the French, but everybody knows they operate for the French. And you can figure out, you know, I mean, they 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 have done a lot much higher level technology transfer with india and space cooperation and stuff you know but they i mean they'll sell submarines to australia and to sorry to india and pakistan you know like they're they're the french <laughs> um but they're physically in the region i mean as for the other ones um they're realizing that the 21st century is the century of the indo-pacific and not the atlantic um uh and it's going to be for the countries of the region to figure out whether this is beneficial for them or not. 
I mean, they, there's no divine right of access for the Dutch into the Indo-Pacific or the Germans into the Indo-Pacific or the British, you know, and we need to see, you know, how they clear up, it's all about China. So how they clear up their relationships with China. And if they're Germans are pretty heavily compromised by China. So what are they going to do when they come into the Indo-Pacific? So I, I don't, your answer is better than mine. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I think, I think this aptly captures what you've been trying to tell us. And uh, yes, I think if anything, this sums up that the fact that you repeatedly mentioned how this century is the Indo-Pacific century is really, it captures the essence of this entire interview. So thank you so much for your wonderful insights. And I am confident that our audience will enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed hosting it. It was a great learning experience. Thank you so much, Cleo. It's always a pleasure to have you. And yes, we will, of course, uh, be hosting you soon again, whenever you're free. Thank you so much, Cleo. Thank you once again. We're looking forward. Th thank you. And I encourage everybody to go watch all the other videos and interviews that they've done, because that's where I'm learning my stuff. So if I'm wrong, it's it's my fault, but it's not, not because Usanas didn't try to make me smarter. Thank you, Cleo. Thank you so much. Hope you have a good day ahead. Thank you, Cleo. Okay, good night. Bye. Bye.